All right, all right. We're on part eight. Um, we're on First Corinthians four. We've gotten all the way to verse twenty-six. And verse twenty-six reads, "How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has their own psalm, has their own doctrine, has their own tongue, has their own revelation, has their own interpretation." And then he says, let all things be done unto edifying. He's basically saying, all of you can't preach. All of you can't be the preacher. All of you can't be the premier speaker. All of you can't do the same exact things when you come together in the house of God. And this is funny because this is what happens today. What happens today is we, we find a lot of people in church fighting. And their gifts are fighting each other because they're unlearned or because they're, they're not accepting the fullness of the teaching. And uh, they're not they're not operating the gifts in love. And because of that, it would be made to look like to the uh, to the unbeliever or to the unlearned person that they were being used by some demonic force. Because God, of course, is not an author of confusion. So it would make perfect sense for you to say, well, God's not in that because he doesn't he doesn't orchestrate confusion, which is true. But we as his believers do because we're human. And if our mind isn't renewed to the truths of the gospel, we do things out of zeal, but we do them in error. I don't think necessarily that Corinth knew that they were doing these things completely in error. I think that they had a zeal after God and they had a zeal after uh, gifts of God. And that zeal was good. But because they only had a zeal with no knowledge base, they lost out on what the truth of it was and what the reason was. So Paul had to do a lot of reproving there. I think on the other on the other uh, side of that spectrum, you can have somebody who has all of this knowledge but no uh, faith and no uh, focus on spiritual gifts. And if you have that and not the other, you're just as bad. So there's a balance that's necessary. There's a need for everything to be level and equal. So let's keep reading. All right. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue. This is where he comes down with the rules. Let it be by two. Or at most by three. And that by course. And let one interpret. All right. What is he saying? He's saying. If y'all going to do this, I said all of y'all doing this, because he just said in the verse before that all of them had their own <laughs> interpretation, their own tongue and everything. He said, I said all of y'all doing this in the congregation, if it's going to be done, let it, let it be done by one, two, maybe three. And let it be done by course, which means in order. Like when one is, pro when one is speaking in tongue, another one can't be speaking in tongue at the same time as the first person. Okay, all three of them shouldn't be speaking in tongue at the same time. It says by course, which means it should be one, it should be another, and it should be another. And they all, or one, should be there to interpret. And I would take that to mean that, that the one that was speaking in tongue or, or another person that was there that, that picked up from divine revelation what, excuse me, what God was saying would interpret. Now, since it said let one interpret and it's talking about three people doing it, I would also venture to believe that the one that he was talking about interpreting was by course whichever one was speaking in tongue at that time. Because it would make sense to me to say that, that if one person is speaking in tongue and, and they're doing it by course, then once they complete another person starts speaking in tongue by course and then another, then it would make sense to me to believe that one would do it and probably prophesy or um, edify the church with the interpretation of it. And then another one would start and then they would do the same and then another one would start and then they would do the same. Now, that there might be anthonyology on that, but that would be the interpretation that I received from it. Okay? Because uh, that would make perfect sense to me in line with what he's saying. Okay, so, all right, um, that was verse 27. 
verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent, silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. And that seems like it further validates what I was just saying. If there is no interpreter. Now, he just talked about a possibility of up to three people speaking in an unknown tongue in course. But then he says, if there be no interpreter, I believe what he's actually saying is that if none of the men can interpret what it is that they're saying, let each of the men shut up and speak in himself to God. Instead of him coming out of his mouth with it and distracting the entire service, I believe that Paul is saying instead of him distracting the entire service with something that nobody's going to be edified on, just Speak it into a self. Now, mind you, he's going to begin to say things that, that, that that's going to lead you to understand that this is not something that takes control of you. It's something that is under your control. Prophecy is something that's under your control. All of these gifts are under your control. Why? Because they're gifts to you. They're used by you. You have to will to do them. Your will can will to do them and your will can will to cut them off. Speaking in tongues is not like throwing up. It's not a, 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 a reaction or, or just this uh, gag reflex. It's none of that. Speaking in tongues is something that you have to will to do. It means that it, it takes your mind to do it. Now, your mind doesn't understand what it is that it's saying unless it's asked for an interpretation. But you have to will or desire to do it. Okay? So I believe that that further establishes that point that if each one of you don't have an interpretation, hey, man, just just be quiet. Just be quiet and let the service go on. And you just pray inside to God. OK. All right. Now, verse 29, it says the same thing about prophecy. Verse 29 says, let the prophet speak two or three and let the others judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. All right. 31. But you may all prophesy one by one that all men learn. And all may be comforted. So what is he saying? He's talking about the same thing about doing it by course. Don't do it in confusion. It shouldn't be 10 people prophesying in the room at the same time. It makes no sense. When prophecy is going forth, shut up. Respect that person's gift, that person's space in the building, that person's opportunity to edify another. And when they complete, then you can go. But do it by course. Make it make sense. Make it be organized. It's orderly. Okay. 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn. All right, I read that one. 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. See, he's validated even more. He's saying this is something that you're in charge of doing. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, meaning that if you want to prophesy, it's subject to you. If you want to speak in tongue, it's subject to you. Why? For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. That's verse 33. Now, when we come back, we'll be talking about verse 34, which is the topic that, uh, excuse me, that Ringo touch bases on um, in one of the scriptures. And I'm pretty sure it's going to get some people PO'd, but 34 is what we'll be talking about next. Stay tuned.